And I love Steve Key. Thank you, for Steve. And it is an honor and joy to be with you here today at this very, very special occasion. We've been here for all the uh, services that uh, Kyle and I have. It's been a remarkable weekend. I had never heard of OHOP. I've been to IHOP, but I've never heard of <laughs> I never heard, I've uh, never been to Old Hop, and, and so I was really, uh, I, I love Frank and Graham, I love what, what they do and their family, and uh, it's, their son Will serves with me on the Board of Trustees and Liberties, and I love Will, but just getting to know uh, the Grahams more, but uh, to come here and to see what God is doing, this is the best kept secret in America. Uh, the, the whole country needs to know about what is going on uh, with our veterans here, uh, with uh, with Operation Heal Our Patriots. What a remarkable, remarkable opportunity for God to do a work uh, in our lives. When I came home from Vietnam, there was nothing at all like this anywhere uh, uh, by any stretch of the imagination, nothing like this. And our, our veterans, uh, Vietnam veterans came home to horrible atrocities, um, they were spit upon, had bags of urine thrown at them, cursed, called them horrible, horrible, terrible names. And uh, so many of them went into uh, seclusion and, uh, and then many of them turned to drugs and alcohol and, and uh, many of them took their lives. And so there's nothing like this at all today. I, I hope that you really do genuinely appreciate what God has provided for you in Alaska and then here in Denver, Colorado. I hope that you will get on your knees and your face before God and thank God for what he's doing here, the opportunity for him to do it in your heart and in your mind. Connie, where's my wife at? Do you stand up? I want you to turn around if you would. I want you to meet my wife, Connie. And, uh, We've been married now 52 years. We have three wonderful children, and uh, they all three love the Lord. And they've all three grown up, and they all three left home, and that's a good thing. <laughs> so I said, the American dream is knowing your own home. I said, the American dream is to get your kids out of your home. <laughs> Maybe you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> The things that have turned our lives upside down are our grandchildren. For years and years and years, I would say we had six grandchildren, but as of uh, a few months ago, we now have seven grandchildren. Jack came in our lives, adopted by our youngest daughter and son of all, Emma Jonathan, and Jack has turned our lives upside down. And, and you can, uh, I've got probably about 12, 1,300 pictures of him on my phone if you want to see pictures of him after the service. And, uh, but you can go to Facebook and, and see pictures of him as well. He is an amazing, amazing little boy. And God has blessed us uh, so very, very much. If you have a copy of the Bible today, I want you to turn to the book of the Revelation, chapter number 12. Revelation chapter number 12. And, and then uh, I'm going to talk to you about my story today and talk to you about my story. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about your story uh, as well. All the messages this week, I, I put on uh, Facebook and Twitter that, that preachers need preaching. And I have needed every single message that I have heard here uh, this weekend. God spoke to my heart directly. And uh, then the, the, the singing, the music, the worship, all of it has blessed my heart. This morning, that they, the, the, the singers could not have picked the greater uh, 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 set of songs uh, for this evangelist. I'm kind of old school and, and uh, just the way I, I made, but all these songs today has just lifted up the name of Jesus and exalted him and, and uh, made me want to love the Lord uh, even more. I kind of felt like we met a lot of new friends this week. We do, we love you, and even if I haven't been able to shake your hand or, or talk to you, I want you to know that we do love you. If I could ever, ever help you in any way, I would want to do that. I've spent the last 50 years of preaching the gospel and pouring my life, and especially into our veterans. I love you today, and I mean that from the depths of my heart. Stories are important. All through the Bible, 
we have pictures of stories. It all starts with Adam. Did you men ever stop to think what it would have been like to have been Adam? Adam had a wife and never had a mother-in-law. <laughs> That's a story. But Adam had a story, and Noah had a story, Abraham and Moses had stories, Joshua and Isaac and David had stories, Daniel, Shadrach, Elijah, and Elijah had a story, Samson had a story, Jonah had a story, Nehemiah, Stephen, John, Zacchaeus, Peter, Paul. There's a whole chapter in the book of Hebrews we oftentimes refer to as the faith chapter. And in that chapter, there's one man after the other listed because of their great faith stories. But did you know that right in the middle of all these great men, there's a woman by the name of Rahab. Do you know what Rahab was? Rahab was a prostitute. Rahab was a harlot. And yet there comes a day in her life when she too puts her faith and her trust in God. And God thinks so much of her faith that he puts her in the faith chapter. I'm speaking to someone today and you feel like you've messed up. You've shipwrecked. And you're thinking there's no way that I can have a story. There's no way I can have a testimony. But I've got good news for you today. Number one, you're in this room right now. You're breathing air and that means you're alive. And number two, my God is a God of a second chance. And sometimes a third, and sometimes a fourth, and even more, as some of us can testify. When you go out to the cemetery and you see a headstone, there's enough information on that headstone. We know something about the person that is buried in that particular spot. We know their name, of course. And then maybe there's something about their military career. Maybe something about their family. Maybe a favorite Bible verse. But then there are the dates. The date that the person was born, and then the date that the person died. But ladies and gentlemen, more important than the two dates, in between the two dates is a little dash. And it's what's on your dash that matters the most. What happened from the time that you took your first breath to the moment that you took your last breath? That's your story. That's your testimony. Look at Revelation chapter 12 and verse number 7. And there was war in heaven. Now there's going to be another war in chapter number 19. And that will be the war that ends all wars. But this is a, this is a war in heaven and Michael and his angels fall against the dragon and the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not and neither was their place found anymore in heaven and the great dragon was cast down that old serpent called the devil and satan which deceiveth the whole world he was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him and i heard a loud voice saying in heaven now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Now the question is, how would they overcome this accuser? The one that in verse 9 refers to as the great dragon, the old serpent, the devil, and Satan. How would they overcome? And an even more pertinent question for you and I today, how are we to overcome this the great accuser? There's two ways. And the very next verse tells us how. Are you ready for it? Here it is in verse number 11. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. What's your story? What's your testimony today? 
I was raised in a pastor's home. My dad was a Southern Baptist pastor for almost 60 years. He liked just a few months being six full decades of pastoring and preaching God's word. My mom went to heaven after my dad, so that made my mom a pastor's wife for almost 60 years. My mom was one of the most godly women I've ever known in my life. My mom and dad were the hardest working people I've ever known in my life. My dad was a bivocational pastor for some time, and he worked three jobs just to take care of a family of seven. He drove a bus to school. He'd come home and change clothes. He'd go roof houses, and then come home and change clothes. He'd drive the bus in the afternoon, then the evening. He'd visit the hospital and prepare messages and Sunday school lessons. A hard, hard working man. My mom, when, when she was 91 years old, was still mowing her yard with a push mower. Oh. I'm not talking about the kind you push the hammer down and it takes off. I'm talking about a real push mower. She called me one day and she said, Tim, I sold my car. I was shocked. She drove herself everywhere. She was a good driver. And, and she said, I sold my car. And I said, Mom, why did you sell your car? She said, I'm 91. I've never had an accident. I've never had a ticket. And I want to go out on top. <laughs> hey, I didn't say that when I was 17 years old. <laughs> But do you know what you do when you're raised in a pastor's home? You go to church. You go to church all the time. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. I told a group of young people the other day, I was on drugs whenever I was nine years old. Mom and dad drug us to church Sunday morning. They drug us night, Sunday night. Every time the doors were open, we went to church. And you know something? It didn't hurt us a bit. I want to tell you something, parents. It's a good thing for you and your children to be in church. Amen. Amen. When? Every time the doors are open. But li listen to this, these verses in Deuteronomy and chapter number six. This is for the young adult parents here today. And there's a bunch of you. This is for you. In verse number five. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. What are you talking about? The Word of God. When are you talking about it? When you sit down, when you rise up, when you go by the way. And who are you talking about it to? To your children. Hey, as important it is for your children to be in Sunday school or a small group or in a water program or, or even in a Christian academy, all that's great and wonderful. But hey, parents, it's not their primary responsibility to teach your children the Bible. It is your responsibility to teach your children the Word of God. That's the kind of home that I was raised in when I was only 10. The greatest thing that would ever happen in my life happened to me in North City Baptist Church in North City, Illinois on a Sunday morning in January. For the first time that I can remember in my life, conviction came to me. I don't know if you understand conviction or not, but the best way that I can explain it is when God himself comes to you personally and he begins to speak to you personally about big stuff like life and death and heaven and hell and eternity and when conviction comes to you when god comes to speak to you personally especially in a setting like we're in right now you would probably be the most miserable person in the room you would like for the preacher just to shut up no more singing Please help me get me out of here. But let me tell you something, friend. If conviction was to come to you today while I'm speaking to you, what you ought to do, you ought to thank God for it. You know what it means? It means God loves you. This means this one true and holy God wants to have a personal relationship with you. It means He wants you to be His child and to spend all of eternity with Him in this awesome place called heaven. And when I was only 10 years of age, 
conviction came to my life. When the invitation started that morning, I was the most miserable person in the room. All I could see was hell. Someone said you shouldn't get saved just to stay out of hell. Maybe not, but that's not a bad reason to get saved. <laughs> I left my seat that morning and I went and knelt at an old-fashioned altar. My mom came and knelt beside me as a 10-year-old boy. I repented of my sins and received Jesus Christ as my own personal Savior. And I got born into the family of God. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to tell you today, that is the greatest thing that's ever happened in my life. And if you've been saved, it's the greatest thing that has ever happened in your life. I've got to be up front with you. If you've never been saved, if your life has never ever been changed by the power of God, I'm not talking about being a member of a church. I'm not talking about being a Baptist or a Methodist or a Lutheran or a Presbyterian or a Church of Christ or Assembly of God or a Catholic or a Mormon. I'm talking about being born again. I'm talking about your life being changed by the power of God. If that's never happened in your life, then your life is incomplete. You might be the richest person in this room today. You may have more money than all the rest of us have together. But if you don't know Jesus, then your life is incomplete. You might be the smartest person in this room. You may be the most educated person in this room today. But if you don't know Jesus, then your life is incomplete. You may be the most beautiful woman in the county where you live. You may be the strongest man in the county where you live. But if you don't know Jesus, then your life is incomplete. Today, you need Jesus. I was so excited. I told my family and friends what had happened in my life. But then when I became a teenager, something else happened in my life. It never happened overnight, but rather gradually, I started to put things before God. Football, basketball, baseball, track and field, these things soon became my gods. And my dad told me more than one time, Tim, there's nothing wrong with you playing ball unless you put it before God. And I didn't want to listen to that. And little by little putting these things before God in my life, I started to have problems. I began to rebel. I rebelled at school. I rebelled against God. I rebelled against mom and dad. You say, Tim, what did your parents do when you rebelled? They had never read any of Dr. Spock's books on child psychology. He actually believed that if a child was frustrated, whatever it took, get the frustration out and let him do it. If he wanted to pick up a rock and throw it through the window, if that would help him get his frustration out, let him throw the rock through the window. Well, my dad had other ways of getting that frustration out. <laughs> we lived on a farm for a while, and behind the farmhouse was a willow tree. I don't know whether you know what willow trees are good for or not, but you don't get any fruit off of them. They're not even a good shade tree. The only thing they're good for is to get a switch off of them. The only prayer I did back then was for that tree to die. It never did die. <laughs> I'd have to go out and get my own switch. I'd be hurting before I got back because I knew what was about to happen. <laughs> and they would always talk to us before the spanking. And they'd say something like this, Tim, this is going to hurt me. A whole lot worse than it's going to hurt you. I thought, isn't that dumb? If you give me that switch, I'll show you. <laughs> before I joined the Marine Corps that I served under the stars and the stripes. My dad first the stripes, I saw the stars. <laughs> they believed in old-fashioned discipline, but many, many times I'd slip out behind their back to do what I wanted to do. I attended public school. Most of my friends were not saved. Most of their parents were not Christians. And I made up my mind as a teenager that I could live my own life. My junior year in high school set records in the long jump and the hurdles, winning ribbons and medals, but all the time getting farther and farther away from God. You say, Tim, what did God do? God declares in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 19, as many as I love, 
Let me say those words again. Hey, this is God saying these words in Revelation 3.19. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Five of my high school friends were killed in car wrecks. And every time I would see one in the casket, I knew that it very easily could have been me. And God would speak to my heart. But I wouldn't listen. I kept running. I kept rebelling. I graduated high school. I started college the day, working nights. In the meantime, my life became one disaster after the other. I didn't think it could get any worse. But it wasn't long until I got fired from my job. I got kicked out of college. Nowhere to go, nothing to do, and again, my life full of confusion. Walking down the street in my hometown, McLeansboro, Illinois, I went by the post office and I noticed a sign. I'd seen the sign before, but it never got my attention like it did that day. It was a picture of a young man in a sharp looking uniform. At the top of the sign, it said the Marines are looking for a few good men. I was so full of myself, so arrogant. I went into the recruiting office. I told them I had found what they were looking for. <laughs> now, to be honest with you, I was tired of living at home. I wanted to change. I wanted something different. I was tired of being told what time to go to bed and what time to get out of bed, and how to get my hair cut, what I could do and could not do. So I joined the United States Marine Corps. <laughs> wasn't the most intelligent thing I ever did. <laughs> they put me on a Greyhound bus, sent me to Paris Island, South Carolina. I got off that bus and stepped out of those yellow footprints. I met the guy they called drill instructor. The man I was there less than 24 hours when I decided I didn't like him, and he didn't like me. <laughs> but you know the reason why I didn't like him? He was in authority. And I didn't like authority. I was rebellious toward all authority. But I was soon to discover that no matter where I would ever go in this life, that there would always be authority. With God being the supreme in all authority. I laid awake nights, many nights, between 305, thinking about my life, the shame and the disgrace that I brought to my dad's ministry, to my own family. My attitude began to change in boot camp. The Marines had some things to help me change. I graduated from boot camp with a meritorious promotion prior to, prior to first class to ITR, then the engineering school at Camp Lejeune, graduated with another meritorious promotion prior to first class to Lance Corporal, and then I received my orders that I was to go to South Vietnam. I had three weeks leave. I went home to Southern Illinois and spent those three weeks with mom and dad on Sunday before I was to leave on Monday. I went to church with my parents, and in the service that morning, I seriously thought that I had made things right with God. On Monday, Mom and Dad drove me to St. Louis. I got on that plane, and no more got out the wrong way, and I basically told God that I couldn't do it. Those men were Marines. I was afraid they'd laugh at me. I was afraid they'd make fun of me. Went to Vietnam for nine months. And I didn't go back to do a lot of things that I had done before, but listen to me this morning. If you're not for the Lord, then you're against him. For the believer in this room today, for the Christian in this room today, there's no middle ground. Today, you're either helping the cause of Christ or you're hurting the cause of Christ. I had opportunity after opportunity to live for God. Mom sent me a Bible. On the inside of that Bible, she wrote several things to me up front. And then she wrote these words, Tim, this Bible can keep you from sin. Or sin can keep you from this Bible. I put it at the bottom of my footlocker. I had no prayer life. I had no testimony. So black marine in my squad by the name of Lee Gore. Lee and I flew to Vietnam on the same plane. We were the best of friends. He was a Christian living for God. I was saved, but I was running from God. Many times I watched as he sat down on the edge of his rack and read his Bible, openly witnessed and talked to other Marines about the Lord. And I knew this was the story. I knew this was the testimony that I was supposed to have, but I wouldn't do it. 
30 days that did not, my top sergeant offered me a desk job. Simply meant that I didn't have to go back out to the field, to the bush anymore. That's where the primary danger was. A desk job was coveted. But for some reason, I turned it down. I told my top that I'd rather spend the rest of my time with my own men in the field. I was told to take them on a mine sweep. I've been on numerous mine sweeps. The only thing particularly different about this one was that some of my men were fairly new in mine. Some had only been there a few weeks, a couple, just a few days. I got my men together early that morning, March the 8th, 1971. I told them that day that I would walk point man. Point man was the first man to squad, 15, 20 meters in another marine, 15, 20 meters in another marine, and we'd be staggered out in that kind of formation. Normally, I would have been in the back of the squad, the Ravenman to call me. I'm trying to be a hero or anything like that, simply showing the new men especially what it was like to walk point. Our jobs locate landmines, rounds had not yet been detonated, and to clear the area of those devices. We walked that morning without any trouble. We found a couple of rounds, we detonated. We stopped at noon, I had to eat, and while I was eating, my friend, my best friend, Lee Gore asked if I wanted him to take over his point. Lee was as well qualified as I, but for some reason I told him I would finish the day and then the next day he would walk point. So we picked up where we left off from. And 45 minutes later, I stepped on a 60 pound mine. It blew me several feet into the air, ripped both of my legs off of my body. I should have been killed instantly. It was a big enough mine to destroy a jeep. We had entered a major minefield. At the very exact moment that I stepped on a mine, a South Korean Marine that was serving with us stepped on a mine, lost one of his legs. Our bulldozer driver set his blade down on a mine. And now there's noise and smoke and chaos and confusion, and I'm in extreme pain. I was only unconscious for a couple of moments. I realized that I'd been hit, but I didn't know how serious it was. I looked up in the midst of all the confusion and chaos, and my head was laying the lap of my best friend, Lee Gore. Lee wasn't cussing the president, or the communists, or the Vietnamese, or no one else. He had tears streaming down his face, and was begging God to help me. And that day, I prayed. I didn't want to die. I wanted to live. It was, I don't remember the whole prayer, but it was a simple prayer, something like these words. God, if you'll let me live and get back home to mom and dad, I'll do with my life what you want me to do. Well, I made God promise after promise after promise, but I never meant it. Like I meant it that day, they came with a medevac chopper, came into the hospital ship, the USS Sanctuary. Second day I was on that ship, two naval doctors basically gave up hope. Infection had set in, high degree temperature, so many complications. Dr. Robert Bailey was one of those two doctors. He and I were reunited in Garland, Texas several years ago in a surprise reunion and he told a thousand people that night that they didn't think that I would live because of the seriousness of my wounds. But God had a plan for my life. I stay on the hospital ship for two weeks, unconscious most of the time. They took me to the island of Guam to the naval hospital where I spent the next two weeks, unconscious most of that time. I weighed 187 pounds before I was here. The island of Guam, I weighed a little less than 80 pounds. During that first four week period, mom and dad received visits from the Marines, the Red Cross, and numerous telegrams. And from what they had been told, they never expected to see the oldest son alive again. But God had a plan for my life. They brought me back to the States, to the Philadelphia Naval Hospital, where I spent the next eight months, eight long months, surgery after surgery after surgery. It was in that hospital, the Philadelphia Naval Hospital. And you gotta remember, this is 53 years ago. We didn't have private rooms. We didn't have semi-private rooms. We were on a war. It was, it was like a wide hallway, real long, wide hallway. On each side of the wall, there were, there were, there were beds. At, at any given time, there would be 30 to 40 beds on Ward 1A. If you were on Ward 1A in Philadelphia Naval Hospital, two things about you. Number one, you were a Marine. And number two, you were an amputee from the Vietnam War. And I never saw so much bitterness and so much anger and so much hatred 
in my life as I did. And then all the negative stuff from the professional people, from the people that were supposed to be tending to me and helping me, all the things I'd never be able to do. And they were trying to prepare me for the worst and, the, and to tell me I would never be able to do these things. I, I, a nurse came to my, my bed one Friday and gave me a sedative and said, the doctor's gonna come. I had two young doctors, very inexperienced. And, and their answer about everything was to cut my right leg was at the knee. When they uh, brought me to Philadelphia, they'd been able to save my knee. I'd been able to walk well with prosthetics, but they kept cutting, they kept cutting, they kept cutting. She gave me a set. He said, the doctor's going to come and talk to you in a few moments. Well, I went to sleep. And then he came and rudely woke me out of my sleep. And very coldly, methodically, he said, on Monday, we're going to do a, a hip disarticulation. And then he turned around and walked off. I went back to sleep. When I woke up on my own sometime later, the nurse was standing beside me. She was, a, she was the best nurse that I had the whole eight months in the hospital. And she was always joyful and always positive, always encouraging. But when she's standing there now, she's got tears in her eyes. And she said, Tim, do you understand what they're gonna do on Monday? I said, well, I just assumed it was another surgery. She said, no, no. She said, Jim, they're going to take your entire right hip off. You won't be able to sit up. You're going to have to lay on your stomach or your back for the rest of your life. And my wife is here today. If my three kids were here, if mom and dad were able to be here today, any of my friends are here, they would all tell you they've never seen me bitter, ever. I've never been angry. I've never been bitter about what happened to me on March 8th. I just felt like I was fortunate to be alive. But when that nurse said those words, I went to the bottom of the barrel. I sunk as low as I had ever been. I waited for a while, and then I got in my wheelchair and went all the way down to the end of the ward. At the end of the ward, there's a small room where you can have some privacy where you fend up. There was no privacy on that ward. There were thin cotton curtains that, that, that went between each bed, which were about three or four feet apart. And, and so I went down to the end, and, and that's hilarious. And, and on the wall, there, there's a pay phone. You don't know what I just said. <laughs> <laughs> you actually put money in it, and, and, I, and, I, and, and you know, people on the other end can talk to you. And I called my mom and dad in Southern Illinois. I'm now a 21 year old Marine, and I'm crying. And I told mom and dad what they told me, and I said, told my dad, I said, Dad, I believe I'd rather die than lay on my stomach and my back for the rest of my life. And, and my dad said something that day. I've never ever forgotten, he said, son, we're going to have to trust God. I tell you, at that moment, that was the hardest thing for me to do. I just want somebody to fix this. I just want somebody to make this right. I don't know how it happened. My dad called them and asked them not to do the surgery. They didn't have to listen to him. This is a military hospital. These are officers. I'm an NCO. But they canceled my surgery on Monday. If you don't have surgery on Monday, you go to what we Marines and call stump rounds. This is a different part of the hospital, and you go and on the other side of these long tables, there are doctors, your nurses, your physical therapists, your prosthetic people, anyone who has anything to do with you in that hospital are there on Monday morning. And they're talking about you out loud in front of everybody. They call you up alphabetically. And I, they call me up as a new doctor set between the two young doctors. And he's running the show that Monday morning. And he looks at my, he looks at my paperwork. He's going through all these folders, and, and he looks up to me. And he finally says, "Do you know who I am?" I didn't care who he was. I've just had the worst weekend of my life. I'm not in the mood to play a main game. He said, "My name's Dr. Robert Payton. If you were listening a while ago, you heard me mention his name. He was on the hospital ship. He performed the first surgery on me." He didn't think I was going to make it. And he told them right there that they didn't think that I was going to live. But then he saw what these two young doctors had done to me. He became infuriated. He stood up. Papers flew everywhere. He said some words I didn't want to say what a neighbor say. <laughs> took me to surgery one time. Never took anything off. Said they cleaned up my wound. Put me on a brand new antibiotic. Evidently the two young doctors didn't know anything about. And, and he would come down to the ward, pass everyone else up, and come to me and talk to me. Took an interest in me, never in a hurry. For 
from the time he did that surgery to two weeks later, I was discharged from Philadelphia Naval Hospital. And I haven't been back to a doctor or to a hospital for anything directly related to what happened to me on March the 8th, 1971. I believe as well as I know my name is Tim Lee, that God sent Dr. Robert Bailey to Philadelphia, Philadelphia Naval Hospital. This is his first day in his new duty station. And God sends him there. Well, can I tell you that it today something that God doesn't love Tim Lee more than he loves you. God loves you today. He knows your name. He knows that number of hairs on your head. He knows where you are today. I went home from the hospital of my dad's church. I went forward. I was the prodigal son come home. I went forward publicly and asked for forgiveness. And of course, they forgave me with arms wide open. It was in that church that I met Connie. We fell in love with each other and were soon married. Well, the long after we were married, God called me to preach. Imagine that. A Marine in a wheelchair with no legs. And God called me to preach. Friends and even family tried to discourage me and talk me out of it. But I said, if this is what God wants me to do, that's what I'm going to do. I pastored for five years in Southern Illinois. Now, in my 46th year, as an evangelist, I've had the privilege of preaching in every state, many, many foreign countries, preaching God's Word. And I'm going to tell you now, like I have said so many times, the past 52 plus years of my life have absolutely been the happiest years of my life. You said, but Tim, you're in a wheelchair. Your legs are gone. Today I'm in a wheelchair, but today I'm in the will of God. And that, my friend, makes all the difference in the world. Hey, you're saved today, but you're out of the will of God. You're running from God. I beg you. Come home today. This is your day. And there may be a great number listening to my voice right now, and you've never been saved. Friend, listen to me. It's no accident that you're here. It's no accident that I'm here. God has a plan. I'm getting ready to say now the most important words I would have said here today. Don't let anything interrupt what I'm about to say. Are you ready? Here it is. The most important words. A little over 2,000 years ago, God sent his only son to this earth. God didn't have 20 sons. God didn't have two sons. God had one begotten son, Jesus Christ. He came to this earth, born of a virgin. And he lived on this earth for nearly 33 sinless spotless years. He did no wrong. And then one day, he walked up Calvary's hill willingly, laid down his life for your sins and for my sins and for the sins of the whole world. He hung on an old rugged cross suspended between heaven and earth. And on that cross, he shed his blood. And on that cross, he died. God's only son died. They took him off of that cross and they carried him and they put him in a bottle to him. Ladies and gentlemen, right here is what separates Christianity from every single religion on the face of the earth. For if you were to go to the place where they put the body of Jesus, you wouldn't find him. He's not there on the third day. He got up from the grave victorious over sin, victorious over death, victorious over hell. And today, God's Son is alive. Amen. Amen. Now, here's the great news. He wants to come and live in your life. He said, Jim, how does that happen? How does God's Son come and live in my life and come to this place? And I'm not necessarily talking about the geographical location of the gay Lord. I'm talking about this moment. I'm talking about this time. I'm talking about this place in your life right now to understand in the sight of this holy God that you're a sinner. The Bible says, so we've all sinned and come short of God's glory. I've sinned. We've all sinned. It's our sin that separates us from God. It's our sin that keeps us from having a right relationship with God. And it is our sin that would separate us from God for all of eternity in a horrible, 
terrible place called hell, except for the fact that a price was paid for our sins. God's only son paid the price for our sins on that cross. And today, if you're willing to repent of your sin, if you're willing to turn from your sin and turn to Jesus, listen to this, the very moment that you by faith say yes to Jesus, what are you saying yes to? To the cross, to the blood that was shed, to the death that was died, and to an empty tomb, to a risen Savior. The very moment that you by faith say yes, you become God's child forever. Wouldn't you like to know that when you die, that you would spend eternity with God in that awesome place called heaven forever and ever? You say, well, Tim, I'm, I'm not planning on dying anytime soon. And I don't imagine any of us are planning it. But I tell people all the time, you don't have to go to heaven. And you don't have to go to hell. But you can't stay here. You're going to spend eternity in heaven or in hell. And it all depends on what you do with Jesus. This could be the greatest day of your whole life. Would you bow your heads this morning? I'm going to ask that no one talk to anyone. No one disturb anyone. Matter of fact, just in your mind, draw an imaginary serpent around yourself. I want to ask you something today. When I ask this question, I want you to be honest with yourself, with God, with this evangelist. Nobody's going to embarrass you, no one's going to intimidate you in any form or fashion. But be honest. Maybe for the first time in a long time. How many would say today, Tim, I know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, if I were to die in the next four minutes in this seat where I'm at, if EMT was to come in this room and officially pronounce me dead, I know that I would go to heaven. Tim, I remember the day when conviction came to my life. And I, too, realized that I was a sinner. And that day I remember repented of my sins and I received Jesus Christ as my Savior Tim as sure as I was already there I know that I would go to heaven if I were to die right now I'm saved and I'm not the least bit ashamed of it no one else looking let me see your hands as a way of testimony today is hold them up high well I'll never you can take them down Christian friend never ever ever be ashamed or embarrassed for a preacher to ask you that question and for you to give testimony. There were some, as a matter of fact, there were so many who could not raise your hand. Can I tell you today that I appreciate you being honest? You could have raised your hand when others raised theirs, but you didn't do that. And in just a moment, I want you to let me pray for you. But before I do that, I want to talk to all those that raised your hands, continuing to be honest. Those of you that just raised your hands, how many would say, Tim, I know I'm saved. I know I'm a Christian. I know if I die, I go to heaven. But I also know there's some things in my own life that are not right with God. There's some things in my own life the Lord is not pleased with. And Tim, God spoke to me today. I don't want to run. I don't want to rebel. Pray for me today that I can have these things right between me and God. No one else looking. Let me see your hands hold them up high. Hands raised everywhere, scores and scores and scores. You can take them now. Today I'm going to give the invitation that I give somewhere across America nearly every Sunday of the year. Sometimes nine or ten thousand, sometimes a hundred or less. In a moment, I'm going to ask if our keyboard player can come to the keyboard. Is he available, Edward? If not, we'll just do it a different way. But I'm going to ask all of you, not now, but whenever I have you stand, every one of you that just now raised your hand to leave your seat in a moment. And then I want you to come and stand right here in front of me. We're going to pray together today. God is going to do something in your life. If you're afraid to come to yourself, ask someone to come with you. They'll do it. If someone in your row is in the way, nudge them. They'll move over. They may be wanting to come too. We're not going to wait long. We're only going to have just one or two verses of invitation. That's all. 
So I'm going to ask you to come quickly in a moment. The most important question. Right before I have you stand, right before I have you come, where will you spend eternity? Friend, you not only have a soul, you are a soul. You're going to live forever. Either in heaven or hell. And it all depends on what you do with Jesus. Again, I won't embarrass you. I would never do that. But you care enough about yourself today to release enough pride to let this evangelist pray for you this morning. How many in this vast room would say, Tim, truth of the matter is, I'm not 100% for sure. If I were to die right now, that I would go to heaven. And I certainly don't want to go to hell. And I want you to include me in that prayer. Let me see your hands. Hold them up high. Hold them up high. Numbers and numbers and numbers of hands. You can take them down. Friend, this is your day. Christians, I'm asking you to set the example. I'm asking you to be the first. If you raised your hand a moment ago, you'd be the first to come. It'll help these to come to Christ. I don't try to make it hard for people to come to Jesus. The hard part was done on the cross 2,000 years ago. Remember, we're only going to play through one or two verses. You come as you stand right now. Just stand on your feet. Everyone's able to stand. Come on right now. Come all the way into the middle right here. Make one for others. Come on while he plays right now. Come quickly. Come face with me right here. You are serious. Come on right now. Christians that are right with God, if you just breathe a word of prayer right now for these that are coming, just come as close as you can. Make room for others. This is your day. This is your moment. This is your time. Just another moment because there's so many others making their way. Some of you have been fighting for a long, long time. You've been resisting God's call. Why don't you just surrender today? As Edward said last night, just, just throw it all in. Now, there's two vital parts of this invitation. We're going to deal with the absolute most important part first. I need you to listen very carefully. Even if you're moving and coming forward, just listen so carefully. I don't want the devil to get one single victory here today. If you've never been saved, or if you thought you were saved, but today you're just not for sure. You say, Tim, I'm about 90% for sure I'm a Christian. I wouldn't hurt you for anything. You've got to believe that. But if you're 90% for sure, you're saved. You're 100% lost. There is no way you can ever chance 10% and you will be separated from God forever and ever. So if this is your day, then settle it once and for all. You're telling me I can know 100% for sure? Absolutely. 1 John 5, 13, these things have I written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. Not hope so, not think so, not maybe so, but that you may know. So in a moment, I'm going to pray out loud what we oftentimes refer to as a sinner's prayer. And if you want to be saved today, and if you're as serious as you know how to be, whether you're here at the front or even still there in your seat, if you want to be saved today, when I pray this prayer out loud, I want you to pray it in your heart. Understand before you pray with me that the words themselves won't save you. It's not repeating religious words. It's you come into this place in your life to confess that you're a sinner, knowing you cannot save yourself, and you're turning to the one who died for you, the one who rose from the grave for you, Jesus Christ. You're not praying the evangelist Tim Lee. You're not praying that Edward Graham or Don Wilton, not praying the other preacher, the other man, the room, or anyone on the earth. You're praying to the Lord. So while our heads are bowed, 
you want to be saved today, doesn't have to be these exact words, but something like this right now. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. And I know my sins can separate me from you forever. But today, I want to be saved. God, please forgive me of all my sins. Wash me as white as snow. Make me your child. Right now, this very moment, I am trusting Jesus Christ and Him alone as my Lord and my Savior. Take me to heaven when I die, for I am now your child. Our heads are still bowed. No one's looking but myself, the chaplains, and the Lord. If you just now prayed that prayer in your heart, here at the front, or there in your seat, Tim, when you prayed that prayer out loud, I prayed it in my heart, and I meant it with my whole heart. No one else looking. Let me see your hands. Hold them up for a moment. Hold them up for a moment. Hold them up for a moment. Wow. You can take them down. I don't want anybody else to look. Nobody else. Just those that raised your hand. Look right up here at me. I'm, I'm not the greatest at estimating numbers. I normally count numbers when I see hands raised, but there were so many. But I'm guessing 200, maybe far more than that. Those of you that raised your hand at home, they look right up here at me. I can't keep looking at you, but I want you to keep looking at me. That is the most important prayer you will ever pray in your own, in your entire life. The prayer you just prayed right now is the most important prayer you'll ever pray on Sunday morning. In Denver, Colorado, last service, no hope, you said yes to Jesus Christ. And the very moment that you, by faith, when you said yes, you became God's child forever. You've got to hear what I'm about to tell you. Every sin that you've committed in your life is gone. God doesn't just forgive us our sins. He forgets them. Every sin. You think right now what you might believe to be the worst sin you've ever committed in your life. God does not remember it. It's gone. Wait a minute. How do we overcome the accuser? By the blood of the Lamb. Where are your sins? They're washed away by the blood of the Lamb, never ever to be remembered again. Today you have a brand new life. That's why the Christian life is called a new life. You have a brand spanking new life in Jesus Christ right now. And so, you get to tell people, this is your day. People say, well, when did you get saved? You get to tell people, I got saved at the Gaylord on Sunday morning in February 2024. I said yes to Jesus Christ. This is your day. This is your moment. This is your time. He said, Tim, how do I know that I was serious with you when I prayed? You said a while ago, be as serious as I knew how to be. How do I know if I was as serious? I'm going to tell you that a foolproof way. My friend, Dr. Adrian Rogers, is in heaven now, but he used to say it like this. You won't be ashamed of it. And the fact that you raised your hand, and the fact that you're still looking at me right now, says you're not ashamed. I don't know how they're going to want to do it, but I'm going to do something that I do at my meetings. When you get back to your seat today, I want, before we leave, I want you to find a piece of paper. I'm going to hang around for a long time. I want you to find a piece of paper. Doesn't matter what kind of paper, I don't care. I want you to write your name, your address, your phone number, and email. And then I want you to write one word about two or three times larger than your name. I want you to write the word saved. S-A-V-E-D. I love that word. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And I'll be out in the 
in the entry area. I want all of you to bring that paper to me. I'm going to make sure that Everett gets all these papers, but I want you to keep everything going in one direction. I want to hug your neck. I want to shake your hand, however long it takes. This is the greatest day of your life. You can bow your heads back down. The invitation's not over. I know what time it is, and I'm already over by a lot of time. I'm trying to follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit. If you'll give me just a few more moments to do that. There's a lot of people today. There's a lot of people today who said, I know I'm saved. But there's things in my life not right with God. Friend, this is the day. When's the best time to get right with God? Right now. Right now. Just to come clean. And how do I do that? You confess. God said in 1 John 1, 9, if we would confess our sins, that he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. We confess, he forgives. Isn't that a great deal? You're going to do that right now. You don't have to get down on broken glass and cobblestone and beg and plead for hours and hours and hours. You just come clean right now with a broken heart and say, God, I've sinned. I don't want to be right with you. I don't want victory in my life. I want you to use my life to point others to Jesus. So let me pray out loud. You don't have to tell Timothy anything. Just tell God. Lord, thank you for speaking to hearts. And for these that said yes to Christ today, will they'll never be the same, the greatest day of their whole life. And then, Lord, for so many who said, I just want to get my life right with God. I want peace in my life. I want victory in my life. I want to walk with Jesus. I want to talk with Jesus. If you give us 24 hours or 24 years or more, we want our lives to count for you, Lord. I pray today for victory. Our heads are still bowed. I'm going to do something that I've never done. I've given the invitation before, but not the way that I'm going to give it today. Here's what's going to happen. I feel, I even felt last night, as everyone was speaking about the call, even when Bob Wilton was speaking, I felt it. There's so many. Now, ladies, please don't be upset with me. I, I'm a Baptist, and this is the way I do things. And my ministry, so please don't be upset. But I'm talking, we need some men in America. There's going to be men, man up, courageous, backbone, courage, salt, and light. We need some leadership in our men today. And we need preachers. We need preachers. We need God called preachers. We need pastors. We need missionaries. We need evangelists. We don't have nearly enough evangelists. That's what I do. I'm an evangelist. We need hundreds of evangelists. So here's what's going to happen. There's a, there's a ramp over here. I'm going to go down that ramp in a moment. And I'm going to go all the way around. I'm going to go to that corner of the building. If there are men here today, you believe God may be calling you to preach. And you've never surrendered. But you believe God may be speaking to your heart about preaching. Maybe you don't know whether to be a pastor or missionary evangelist. It doesn't matter but you. I'm not talking about a general call to full-time Christian service people. I'm talking about preaching. I just feel that. And I'm trying to follow the leadership of the Lord. And I'm going to be in that corner. And then those of you that are going to get your paper and write your name, give me a few moments and I'll be out in the entry area. All of you, if you were serious, find me. Give me that piece of paper. Father, thank you for what you've done and the victories that's been won. In Jesus' name I pray. Give these folks a great big hand. Let them give back to us. Thank you for the Lord. 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 Thank you for the Lord.